Morning, church. You know, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation, kind of one way, though. And uh, I, want to, I want to, anything that we talk about this morning, none of it is meant to be an accusation or any of that. It's totally meant to be helpful. And words mean a lot to me as you can tell if you've read The Shack or any of the other things. And um, sometimes we get lost in the words or we've reframed words and they've ended up dividing us and we don't even realize it. And so when I said good morning church, the word church has been used to divide us almost as much as any other words that we've ever expressed. And we kind of know what we're saying, but we actually forget about what we know. Um, have you ever heard the, the experiment that the psychoscientists, psychological scientists, not the psychoscientists, <laughs> they did with these monkeys and a banana? and shock collars. You ever heard of that? So what they did is they created this room and they had a little platform in the middle above which they hung a banana. And if you know anything about monkeys, banana is sort of their whole worldview. And, um, but they put shock collars on all five of the bananas, all, all, not the bananas, but all five of the chimpanzees and they let them in the room. And they explored, and finally one of them sees a banana. And so he rushes for the banana, and as soon as he touches it, they shock the other four. Because they're scientists, they're gonna experiment, yeah? So they just thought, I wonder what would happen. And, and so one banana is, you know, enjoying himself, eating a banana, um, one of the chimps, sorry. And then um, the other four are going like, what just happened? So they put another banana in there, and as soon as a chimpanzee touched it, they shocked the other four. Well, after a while, they kind of get the idea, and now they're watching each other, because there's a new banana there, but they're kind of like, don't be touching that banana, right? And uh, if, a, if one of them went toward the banana, the other four moved in front of that chimpanzee. It's like, mm-mm, this is a trap. Right? So that banana just hung there. And the scientists got a little bored, so they thought, well, let's switch it up. So they took one of the monkeys out, and they put a new monkey in there um, that didn't even have a shock collar on. And that new monkey sees the banana and immediately goes for it, and suddenly there are four monkeys in front of him going like, mm-mm. Don't you be touching that banana. And he's confused. He's like, guys, it's a banana. And they're like, mm-mm, because we know something you don't, and you don't be touching that banana. So they took, that, they took another monkey out, put another one without a shock collar in there, and now there's two in there that don't have shock collars and three with shock collars. And as soon as that monkey goes for the banana, the new one, there are four monkeys in front of him Three going like, we know what's going to happen. And one of them going like, I don't know what the hell is going on, but you can't touch that banana. <laughs> Over time, they ended up putting uh, five monkeys in there with no shock collar on. And when the fifth one was put in there, and there are no shock collars on these five monkeys, as soon as he went for the banana, four monkeys got in front of him going like, don't touch that banana. We have no idea why you're not supposed to touch that banana, but you ain't touching that banana. And that's kind of how we learn over time. Right? A lot of us don't have any idea, but we've been trained a certain way. I have a friend whose who's, uh, family had uh, a big roast that they would make at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yeah. And, um, and when they made it, uh, they don't know why, but they would cut the ends off of this thing. And this is 
if you've heard about this, this is actually somebody I know. And so they cut the ends off of it. Nobody knew why they cut the ends off of it. And they'd cook it that way. And finally, one Thanksgiving, someone asked Grandma, why do we do this? And she said, oh, we only had the size of a pan that would allow for that much. So we had to cut the ends off to make it fit in the pan. But it had become now a tradition. A lot of us sort of have a spirituality that's been handed down to us. And, and one of them is how we use the word church. Right? Because you are the church, not this building, not the man-made, mostly man-made, if I'm female-made sometimes, they defend it, but, but it's basically a man-made institutional system. And, and it's not the church. I mean, you can't go or leave something you already are. I mean, think about it. This, oh, oh, by the way, I have to thank you. I walked in here, and I saw that you'd built a room for me. <laughs> I, saw, I haven't seen that in a long, long time, but it, it so describes me. And if I start crying, I'm going there, <laughs> right? Uh, just as an aside. Whenever I get on these tracks, you can say out loud if you like, here we go again. So just saying. But, but you are the church. In fact, you are part of the church in Missoula. When all the epistles were written, all the letters to the churches by the different apostles, it was to the church in Thyatira. It was to the church in Laodicea. By the way, none of them were written to leadership. None of them were written to a pastor. In fact, the word pastor is only in one half a verse in the New Testament. Now, we created the job description. Now, I don't know what that means for you. Don't know what it means for Scott. <laughs> I'm just telling you how it's laid out. It was the church. And, and because we created an institution out of it and replaced the idea of human beings in relationship to each other with a system or a building. I mean, the church in Missoula is meeting all over this city. And if an epistle was written, it would be written to the church in Missoula of which you are a part. What does that mean? That means there's no division. We create the division by humanly constructed institutional systems, yeah? And you don't have to play that game. I mean, this is great, having a building where you can get together and all this kind of stuff. But don't confuse the building and the organization with the church. When you get together with one other person, it's the church gathered. If you go have a cup of coffee, it's the church gathered, right? You'll never be in a smaller group than four anyway. You, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. After that, it's community. It's the, you know, it's, this is the reality in which we have to make a choice because we've divided it not only by building and system, but by those people and us. By, I grew up Christian and Missionary Alliance. I'm telling you, we didn't talk to the Pentecostals. Even though our roots are Pentecostal, somewhere along the line, we decided that the Holy Spirit got replaced by the Bible. You know, that was the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And and so there was this constant division, constant division, constant division. And we lose sight of the fact that we are in the same family, that we are children of God. And, and so we want to we wanna just say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless the church in Missoula as they gather in all these different places, all these different ways. And may we have the realization and the open eyes inside of us to bless them all. To not be those who increase the, divi the division and the separation. That division and separation sets us up for fear. And fear then begins to dominate. And we've, we've got to stop this. And so we need to celebrate the church in Missoula in every form that it rises in. Does that make sense to you? 
when you leave this building, the church will have left the building, right? And so it's don't, don't attach yourself to the building and the structure. It's here to serve your celebration of the life of Jesus. It's not here to divide you from those people, whoever those people are. And again, that's meant to be helpful. It's a little tweak, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a tough one to get out of because all the monkeys before us were shocked, right? And, and now we're doing things because we actually don't know. And there were monkeys who, who just by their action told us how to live our lives, but they probably didn't have shock collars on by the time they showed up either. These little things actually matter. We are the church in Missoula celebrating. We're in Missoula, but we are of Jesus Christ. We are in it, but we're not of, of the institutional religion. It's the church of Jesus Christ, period, period. No additions to that. And yeah, we come from a tradition. Mine was Christian Missionary Alliance. Mine had certain structure and had, had some beautiful things, including a lot of theology that was very helpful, but it brought a lot of baggage with it. And we then began to see ourselves in opposition to some of the other little groups. You know, when I was in college, I was part of a, in Canada, a drama group. And, uh, and we used to tour around as part of a college program. We had one play that we did where the church had split so many times there were only two guys left. And they were having a meeting and one was gonna kick the other one out. I mean, that's what we do, because we don't know better, and we don't know that we are the church of Jesus Christ in Missoula. We just keep dividing, keep dividing, keep dividing. And that kind of breaks my heart, you know? And, uh, and so don't play the game. It doesn't mean that other people won't play the game, because they don't know better. One of the most beautiful things that Jesus ever said, and he said, I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it, was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he did that on the cross, yeah? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When you read the scripture, I hope it just didn't flash by because it's a pretty powerful passage. And when you read a passage like that, don't go looking for other passage to nullify what this one says. Read it for what it says. Um, I have a confession to make to you. I'm not a universalist. <laughs> everybody has decided, not everybody, but a lot of my people have decided that I'm a universalist. Well, it depends on how you define universalism, right? because there are a few different ways to look at it. If by universalist you mean that everything in the entire cosmos was created in Christ Jesus, guilty, right? If by universalism you mean that everything in our brokenness, everything in our darkness, everybody in humanity was assumed inside of Jesus. And when he died, we all died. And when he rose, we all rose. And when he ascended, we all ascended. And whether we know it or not, we're seated in Christ in heavenly places. Right? That the finished work of Christ included every person who's ever been conceived. If that's a universalist, I'm totally guilty. Because I was quoting scripture, by the way. And that's what it says. Um, Baxter has this beautiful way, Baxter Kruger, um, who's a good friend of mine, has this beautiful way of saying, we have this imagination that creation was blown out from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like a soap bubble. And it kind of floats out there. It kind of, it kind of broke off from God, and it floats out there, and it kind of messes itself up. So the Father sends Jesus over there to build a bridge 
back to God the Father. And it's a, it's a separation model. So there is a separation between God and creation. One of the questions is, what's the soap floating in? Right? What's the soap, this bubble, floating in? Space? Well, no, because that's created. It's floating in nothing? Well, nothing is nothing. It's like nothing doesn't actually exist because it's nothing. So what's it floating in? The only answer, and this is from the early church on, that there's no separation. There's no bridge. God doesn't have to build a bridge because all of creation was created in Jesus. John 1, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Everything that exists, all of the entire universe was created in Christ Jesus and is now sustained, held together in him, for him, through him, by him. There's no separation. In fact, separation becomes the most fundamental lie in the world. You have never been separated from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your sin, however we define that, does not separate you. It alienates you, but that's not separation. It alienates you from someone you love, but you can't get away because there's no separation. There's no soap bubble out there. Everything that was created is created in Christ, by, for, through, and in him. And everything in creation is embedded with the complete presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You will not meet a person in whom Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not dwell. Now, that is completely contrary to the way I grew up and the theology inside my tradition. But it is fundamentally scriptural. And it was taught from the early church on. But we got influenced by a lot of lawyers. Augustine was a lawyer, Calvin was a lawyer, Luther was a lawyer. And they, they said some fantastic, you know what Luther's favorite verse was? It was, in Christ, the cosmos was reconciled, past tense. The entire cosmos was recon reconciled. If you think you can do something to save yourself, let me know how it works for you. You'd be the first. Everything in Christ was reconciled. But does that mean what? What does that mean? Now, the other thing, there's two other definitions of universalism. One is that everything will be ultimately redeemed. And the Son will gather up everything and give it back to the Father. That's scriptural. So if that's universalism, I'm guilty again. So it sounds like, yeah. But there is this other thing that says, we have a doctrine that says, we, and it's a logical one, and um, it says, but it's a doctrine. It says that everybody will ultimately be fully restored face to face back to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I hope that's true, but I don't, I don't trust a doctrine. I trust the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it's like, great, but I sound like a universalist, but I don't step into that piece of it, which is the one that I get accused of most often. It's like, then nothing matters. Then sin doesn't really matter. It's everything's going to work out. Everything's going to work out. But any darkness in you has to be destroyed. And what that takes, don't know. Can somebody resist the love of God forever and ever and ever and ever? I hope not. But I trust the love of God. I don't trust the doctrine of universalism. Does that make sense to you? It sounds like a fine line, but it's not. And there, and there are other elements of that that I have a struggle with as well. But the other stuff that all of creation was 
reconciled to God in Christ Jesus? I mean, that's just scripture, and that's what it says, and that everything will be ultimately restored? That's what it says. I'm good with that. So I'm good with this idea of ultimate redemption. It's just some of the elements of some of these other things that I'm, I struggle with that I just don't know. So there you go. So there's these tenses of salvation, like salvation is an absolute finished event in Christ Jesus. We who have been saved. Past tense, finished, completed action. And now, work out your salvation. There's this ongoing element of it. We who are being saved. To, we are, this is um, Ephesians or, anyway, we are, we are the fragrance of Christ to God. For those who are perishing and for those who are being saved. To the one... We are the fragrance of life to life. For the other, a fragrance of death to death. Like, what does that mean? For those who are perishing, that is, for those who are not turning their face, who are alienated from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our lives are a fragrance from life to life. They look at our lives and they go, more is going on here than we thought. They're attracted to life because death is consuming them. The delusion of separation. And for those who are being saved, we are fragrance from death to death. How is that possible? Well, think about it. There is a process in us where everything that is not of love's kind is being destroyed. We have to lay it down. I don't know about you, but my journey has not been easy. And there has been a lot of laying down of even things that I thought were precious that turned out to be not of love's kind and not of being fully human. Broken things. But I was used, you know, I, I built a prison that I called home. And the activity of God is to start to burn everything that is dead wood out of my life. And I'm telling you, it has not been without pain and suffering. There has been a dying in that. That is what happens. And I can, I can tell you a lot of that story. But it's taken me my whole life to continuously lay down, lay down, and, and die to fill up the sufferings of Jesus. So, what does this all mean? I'm not telling you things like this so that you can, through information, take a stand. You know, it's, it's like in my family extended relationships. I got vaccinated, and I'm not making a political statement here. Some of my family refuses. So I could pile up all the information and try to convince them, you know, that's not helpful. Because, you know, and I think this is a, an American thing because of individualism. I'm Canadian. It's a Canadian thing, too. And um, because of individualism and all this other stuff, it's like when you decide something's right, you kind of dig in your heels, and then you pour concrete on your feet. And I think there's a deep underlying shame in this culture that, that doesn't want to admit ever that it's wrong or that it made a mistake, right? And it's fear-based. Either way, either way, it can be fear-based. And, um, and I love my family, but let me tell you, this whole thing becomes an invitation to fear, and then fear becomes an element of separation, and we end up not loving one another. And the question is, do the things that I trust create a fruit in me that is actual love? Right. John, wrote, John wrote the gospel of John at the end of his life. And, and most scholars believe that he wrote 
the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus, before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And he saw the fall of Jerusalem coming because of Daniel, if nothing else. And, uh, and he writes the revelation, and he addresses to the church in Laodicea, to the church in Thyatira, and all of these things. But it begins with this unveiling of the person of Jesus. There are two beasts that look like each other, or two animals that look like each other in the book of Revelation, and they both are a lamb. One lamb is the slain Jesus. And I heard behind me when, he, when it says, who's worthy to open up the purposes of God? And I heard behind me the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I, I turned and I saw a freshly slain lamb. That's Jesus. And the whole of the unveiling of Jesus has to be seen through this freshly slain lamb. Later, we're introduced to another lamb. It has no blood marks on it, and when it speaks, it has the voice of a dragon. And it gives worship to empire, right? It's saying, who is like the other beast, which is the political beast? And there is an attachment between this false beast and the political beast. And it's, it was a problem in the early church. Swords and empire had invaded into the community of faith. Now, what that means to you, I don't know. But in terms of the revelation of Jesus, it was incredibly powerful. Our allegiance is to the freshly slain lamb. Our allegiance is to Jesus. We are the church not of Missoula, but in Missoula of Jesus Christ. And that's where our allegiance is, to Jesus. I wanted to um, read you a little bit of Acts. Now, Acts, this passage is kind of a problem. And to my people, it's definitely a problem, so they don't usually spend any time here. It's, and <clears throat> here's the situation. Paul, is, Paul loves the Greeks, the, the Greeks and the Jews that are spread out over the world. And Paul and John ended up both in the Greek world, Roman world, Greek world. Roman world, that was sort of the uh, power side of the equation. The Greeks were the culture side. They had all the artists, the mathematicians, the scientists, and, and Rome had the warriors. And so you had those two components. And both John and uh, Paul spent the majority of their time. Paul ended up the last 30 years of his life basically living in Ephesus, which was, which was the center point of Greek culture. Paul goes there, and the first time he goes there, he, he finds out that the Greeks all go up to the Aragopic, whatever that long word is, and it, it means the Mars Hill. And uh, that's where the Greeks would all get together and they'd have their conversations and discussions. And they'd, they'd look into every new idea and philosophy that was coming down the pike. And Paul goes up, well, they ask him. He was talking to the Jews that were dispersed in Ephesus, and the Greeks heard about it, and they said, come up so that we can have this conversation. And this is what happens. It says, and Paul stood in the midst of the era, of that long word, and he said, men of Athens, I... I observe, so he's actually in Athens, Athens at this point, not Ephesus, so I was wrong about that. And um, he said, men of Athens, I observe that you're very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, I am here to proclaim to you the God who made the cosmos and all things in it, since he is a Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Listen, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one, Adam, 
every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, determining their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of you. For even, uh, for, for we live, we, all these pagans that he's talking to, right? For we live and move and have our being in him. As even some of your own poets have said, we are also all his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to, to men that all people everywhere should change their minds. So a couple things. Paul states, and you know it's funny when he quotes, as even your poets have said, we live and move and have our being in him. And when he quotes, um, uh, we are all his children, right? We live and move and have our being. Oh, and it's, he's quoting the hymn to Zeus. He's using their language to tell them the truth about who they are, that there is an unknown God that you don't know, and you move and live and have your being in him. And he gives to every person life and breath and every good thing. That's a problem with my, for my people because we built this model of separation, that there is a bridge, and you can get across the bridge if you pay the bridge keeper, who is Jesus. And how do you, how do you pay the bridge keeper? You, you pray the sinner's prayer. That's how you do it. And the sinner's prayer is only it's less than 200 years old. It was not the standard thing that has existed, and it's definitely not in Scripture. And so it's like, ah, we are all children of God. There's not a person you will meet that is not a child of God. That's a problem for my people because we have such a model of separation. Does that mean, does that, mean that everybody's in? Well, define in. Does that mean that everyone is in Christ? Ah, absolutely. Does that mean everybody is in the Father and indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Does that mean sin doesn't matter? Absolutely not. And if you want to read an incredible book that was written in the 1800s by the mentor of C.S. Lewis, it's by George MacDonald, and it's called Unspoken Sermons, Creation in Christ. And MacDonald not only influenced C.S. Lewis, we wouldn't have C.S. Lewis and the Narnia tales and pretty much everything that he wrote after he ran into one of McDonald's adult fantasy books. He said, when I first was exposed to McDonald, my mind was baptized, and it took the rest of me 18 years to catch up. McDonald was a Scotsman. And if you, if you want to read that book, look for the edition by Roland Hein, H-E-I-N, because McDonald's writings, unless they're tr interpreted or translated into our English, they're very Scottish and very hard to follow, and Roland has helped, helped that. But in McDonald's book, he lays out what C.S. Lewis then uses other language to talk about. And C.S. Lewis said after he was exposed to McDonald, he never wrote one thing that McDonald was not in. And if you've read The Great Divorce, there's a Scotsman in The Great Divorce, and Lewis in his introduction says it's George MacDonald. And George MacDonald lays this out. Nobody gets away with anything. Everybody pays to the last farthing. What does that mean? That means that God is not just out to ignore what human beings have done. He is out to destroy everything that keeps you from being fully human and fully alive. Everything. And if that takes... The ages of judgment, which is ionios in the Greek, it's plural, and it's post-mortem. If that takes the ages of the refiner's fire, it's going to take ages of refiner's fire to burn out of you the wood, hay, and stubble, everything that keeps you from being fully free and fully human. 
This is the work of God to destroy in you any darkness. Because how could you feel comfortable in the presence of absolute light and love if there remains anything in you that is darkness? Now, that's a way bigger picture. And in, in the way I grew up, death was salvation. And after that moment of death, everything was okay for those who had prayed the sinner's prayer. I was, um, there, I was, I got a phone call, uh, a friend of mine, and he had an Indonesian um, uh, high school girl that had come as a foreign exchange student for a year and was living with his family. And she came in as um, a Buddhist, a Buddhist or a Hindu? A Buddhist. Her family's all Buddhist. Her grandparents are Buddhist. Um, the culture that she lived in was all Buddhist. And, um, and while she was here, she read The Shack, and it completely reoriented her life. And she got involved in a lo local fellowship and uh, had gotten involved in the youth group, which she completely loved. They became her friends and family while she was in the United States. And, um, but then she was, she was going to leave and go back to Indonesia. And she said to her house father, my friend, who had never told her that he knew me. And she said to him one day, you know, if I had a bucket list, in my bucket list is I one day want to meet the author of The Shack. So he gives me a phone call and he says, I don't know where you are, what your schedule is, but would you come meet with this girl? She's a couple weeks away from going back to Indonesia. Indonesia has got a soft spot in my heart because I grew up um, in New Guinea, which eventually became West Papua, that is Indonesian. And so that part of the world, I'm a missionary kid, and that part of the world is very meaningful to me. And, and I, I love playing this kind of a, a scenario. I, 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 when people, it's an invitation for me. And um, so we decided to meet at St. Arbuck's down by the airport. And so we, um, I go down there, and, and she is, she's like blown away because it's just been one of those things she had on her bucket list. And so we sit outside of St. Arbucks for like two hours, and, um, and we start. And like a lot of conversations, they start on the outside of a circle, and then they get toward the middle. And finally, we get to something that is really deeply on her heart. And she says, I have a problem. And I said, well, what's that? And she tells me about the youth group that she's been a part of, and she says, now, I'm going to go back to Indonesia, and they've started to talk to me about they're going to be praying for me so that I could take my stand as a Christian. And I don't know what that means, because my grandmother and I always went to the Buddhist temple once a week, and I'd go. I wasn't, like, committed to the Buddhist philosophy or anything like that, but I went with my grandmother because I love my grandmother. And my family is all Buddhist. And so I'm confused about what does it mean for me to now take my stand as a Christian going back to my Buddhist family? And I said, ah, that's simple. She goes, it is? I said, yeah, don't be a Christian. And she goes like, don't be a Christian? What should I be? I said, be a be a Buddhist follower of Jesus. She goes, like, you're allowed to do that? I said, yeah, I know Christians who are followers of Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus never was a Christian. You know, it was a pejorative term when it first showed up. It was kind of, oh, I was on a flight on my way here, and I sat next to a gal, and we got all this conversation going. She's like, where, what are you doing in Missoula? And, uh, uh, she was going up to Bear Creek Lodge that her mother owns and runs. And, uh, and she's going with her, some of her friends. And she's like, what are you doing in Missoula? I said, I don't know. Well, who's, who's bringing you in? And, and she says, oh, I, I say, oh, there's a, a gathering, a community of faith called uh, Zoo Town. She goes, oh, that hipster place. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, 
And uh, so, you know, oh, that hipster place. And if, if, if you went and had a conversation about Zoo Town all over town, I'm sure you'd get some pejorative language. Oh, but when they, when they accused early followers of Jesus as being the Christ followers, it was not meant as a compliment. But they went, okay, that's what we are. But it's not an identity. Jesus is the identity, right? So people ask me, so are you a Christian? And I have either one of two responses, depending on how, how I sense the, the conversation. One is, tell me what a Christian is, I'll tell you if I'm one of those. Because a lot of times, I'm not one of those. Or I say, oh, when it's helpful. Because <laughs> I'm a Christian when it's helpful. When I'm around my people, it's helpful. <laughs> you know, when I'm around my atheist friends, a lot of times they've been burned so bad by the institutional religious system, it's not helpful. Or sometimes it is. You know, I tell my atheist friends, you know, they're halfway from religion to Jesus. It's kind of true. And um, um, here I go, right? Side story. I, I have this friend. Of, if I lose track, remind me to finish my story with St. Arbucks and this Indonesian girl, because there's not much left. And, uh, and so I have a friend um, up in Seattle, Jim Henderson. And, and Jim is an ex-pastor, uh, Foursquare. Um, and um, Jim it paints houses for the most part, but he speaks, he's brilliant, and he does all this creative stuff. Um, and he, dis he went online one time on eBay, and he found that an atheist was selling his soul on eBay. I mean, it was an auction for the atheist soul. So Jim bid on it, and he got the atheist soul for $504. And the, the atheist said, for every 10 bucks somebody pays for my soul, I will spend an hour in the church of their choice, right? And he's not talking about the church in Missoula of Jesus. He's talking about whatever kind of expression of Jesus' life anywhere you want. So Jim bought it for 504 bucks. Um, the atheist's name was Hemet, um, Meta. And and Hemet says to Jim, I've got a full-time job, so we're going to have to figure this out. But Hemet has a friend named Matt Casper. And Matt took up the challenge on Hemet's behalf and said to Jim, well, I've got a bunch of free time because of the kind of work that I do, so I'll do this with you. And they went all over the country to every kind of flavor of the expression of Jesus, whether it was Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Pentecostal, wooey, um, serious, uh, liturgical, uh, scholastic, all these different things. And they go, and they wrote a book together called uh, Jim and Casper Go to Church, right? It's a great book. So I was going to go speak down in Southern California, and Jim was going to be there, and so was Matt Casper, the atheist, right? And Jim says, I really want you to meet my friend Matt. So I go there, and Jim brings Matt. And Matt wanted to meet me because he loved the shack. And, uh, and so the first thing that Matt does is he introduces, I'm Matt um, Casper. I'm an atheist. That's how he introduces himself. Um, and I said, no, you're not. He goes, I am so. I said, actually, you're not. I am so, right? Uh, he was offended. And, um, and I said, nah, I said, tell me what you believe in. And he's, he's like, you want to know what I believe in? I said, yeah. He says, nobody ever asked me that. They always ask me what I don't believe in. I said, no, I'd, seriously, I'd like to know what do you believe in? And he sits for a second, and he, I said, we're standing, and he says, I'll tell you what I believe in. He says, I believe in the love that I have for my boys. He goes, Paul. I actually didn't know this kind of love existed in me. And he, these are the exact words that he used. I would step in front of a bullet for them. And I said, so could I describe this as self-giving, other-centered, 
self-sacrificial love. He goes, that's exactly what it is. You know what that's the definition for? Agape. When it says God is love, that's the definition. So he is finding in himself. Now, we used to think growing up in our tradition that they just faked it. They didn't actually love their kids like that. They just thought they did, you know, because they couldn't because they were separated from God, right? But he is describing that in him is this capacity that he didn't know existed to love his children with this self-giving, other-centered, self-sacrificial love. And I said, oh, okay, so you believe in that kind of love. So it's not romantic love. It's not, it, it's agape, the very definition of the nature and character of God. And it's not that God is agape over here and justice over here. God is love, which means relationship is at the very core of God. This is why I love the Trinity. Because if you have God ever by God's self alone, love cannot exist. In fact, this is why in Islam, God is not love. God is merciful, God is kind, God is just, but not love. The reason is theological and justified if you accept the premise that God is monad, that is by himself, alone. That there is one God, which we also believe, but there is one God. And in Islam, if God were to be love, God would need another. And anything that God needs is greater than God. Therefore, the only other that exists is creation. And therefore, if God needs creation, creation is greater than God, and that's blasphemy. You follow? But relationship within the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is this great dance. It took the early church about, I don't know, three, four, five hundred years to come up with a word because they were being accused along the way that, ah, you are tritheists. You believe in three gods. And they're going like, no, 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 no. One God and three persons within the nature and character of God that are in this great dance of relationship. And finally, they found the right word, perichoresis. And if you've been around Baxter Kruger, he talks about that word a lot. One of the definitions of perichoresis is the mutual interpenetration of one with the other without the loss of personhood. Isn't that fantastic? That's kind of like fantastic. It's also the basis for how we need to see marriage or family or, or relationships with each other. Oh, which reminds me, I need your help with something. Kim, who I've been married to now for 42 years, she and I had a conversation last night and she has asked me not to hug which if you know me at all, is incredibly difficult for me. And, but we have some new grandbabies, we don't know, I don't wanna be a carrier, and um, all that kind of stuff. So I'll do the fist bump, but know you're being hugged for a long time, all right? So please, help me with that. And, um, and I told her I would tell you. Okay, <sighs> which rabbit trail was I on? Oh, Matt. So the, the perichoresis word is about God, who is love, therefore relationship is at the center of God. So it's loving justice, it's loving kindness, it's a loving patience because everything goes back to God as love. Love is not an attribute of God. These are different expressions of love. So if you come up with something in which God seems to be not loving, well, that's gonna get us on another little rabbit trail, then um, you are not, you've split the nature of God. You split love from something else. He's love and he's justice, as if they're two sides of a coin. They're not. And um, so, I th and Matt said, and I said, so what else do you believe? He says, I believe in truth. 
I believe in being a truth teller, something at the very core of my heart. For all that's going on, I believe in truth. And I said, well, what else? He says, I believe in kindness. I believe that, that our only way forward is toward. And that kindness is, right? So I'm going like, Matt, you believe in love, not just any kind of love, but other-centered self-giving, self-sacrificial love. You believe in, in truth, and you believe in kindness. And you say you're an atheist? He goes, I know what you're doing. <laughs> we have a two-hour conversation with Jim standing next to us. And it's deep, and it's beautiful. And when he hugs me to say goodbye, he whispers in my ear, I'm so glad to know that you exist. And as he's walking away, Jim goes, Paul, that is the greatest compliment I've ever heard Matt Casper give another human being. When you are the burning bush, when you allow God in his love, in their love, to burn away all the dead wood in your life, that keeps you from being fully human and fully alive. You never have to do anything for God. You become attractive by nature. The burning bush didn't have to go places to get people's attention. They're naturally attractive to something in which everything that is dead is being burned away and everything that is live stays living. I got a call from Matt a couple years later and he says, Paul, Jim and I are writing a new book. And just so you know, I'm still an atheist. <laughs> and he says, we're writing a book called Saving Casper. But I'm still an atheist. He said, I want you to write the foreword. I said, I'd love to. So I write the foreword. It goes to a Christian publisher. And they rewrite the whole thing and send it back. And I'm like, who wrote this? It wasn't me. And I, and I love these situations. It never offends me whatsoever. And I contact Jim and Matt, and I go like, I'm sorry. I'm obviously not the right person to do this. And, um, and Jim knows I'm laughing about it, but Matt thinks I've been offended. And Matt goes, Paul, please. You have to keep in mind that these are Christians. It's baby steps. That's his exact words. And, and so we rearranged some of the things, and I ended up writing the foreword for Saving Casper. And um, so that's that. So I'm back with this girl at St. Arbuck. And, uh, and I just said to her, look, be a Buddhist follower of Jesus. And my heart kind of breaks. I'm a missionary kid. You know how many families we destroyed because we told them to take a stand for a religious ideology? I mean, we tore families apart, and we caused the death of, of members of their families over one religion versus another religion. And it was not necessary. And I said, you know what? You love your grandma. Be a a Buddhist follower of Jesus. Go to the, the Buddhist temple with her. You're not going to be going somewhere where Jesus and Papa God and the Holy Spirit are going like, hey, sorry, can't go in there. There's human beings in there, whether they know it or not. And there are things happening in their lives that are incremental movements toward the truth, towards life, towards light, towards love. And you won't find God absent in that place. You can be there freely. And I'm telling you, the weight of the world lifted off her shoulders. I said, trust the Holy Spirit in you. See, this, this is one thing we have a really hard do time doing, is trusting the Holy Spirit in other people, especially in those that we love the most. We want to control other people, especially those that we love the most because it's like God's not interested enough to control them, so I need to, right? Because I don't, I don't trust the Holy Spirit in them, 
But then again, I don't trust the Holy Spirit in me either. <laughs> this is why we love religion. You don't have to actually trust God. You just have to know what you're supposed to do, right? And uh, my whole life has been a journey toward trust, which is a very... You know that the word believe in the Greek is the word to trust, but we, in our Western tradition, just translated it believe, and we end up with intellectual kinds of doctrinal sort of theological sort of things. And we put our belief in a doctrine about God, in a doctrine about Jesus, in a doctrine about the atonement, in a doctrine about hell. And, and we have lived our lives believing, but not trusting. Trusting is an act of love in which you give your whole self to a God who you believe and believe, trust, knows you and loves you. Trust is a completely different animal. You understand? Than just an, because if you just do it here, then all of a sudden the smart people become the really true believers. And all of a sudden we're divided into a, a million different pieces because of our intellectual education or our theological commitments. This is not about that. The Holy Spirit lives in every single one of you and is your teacher. Does that mean we're off Alone? Well, you're never alone. And we're designed for community and relationship. And inside of that, we learn how to admit we're wrong and that we don't understand things. But we have something inside of us that is moving us in the, these directions. This choice versus this choice. And this is a God who submits by nature. That's a tough thing for my people, too. When, when God says submit one to another, it's because this is the very nature of Trinity. They've always been submitting one to another. God will not ask of you anything that God does not do or is incapable of doing. This is a God who is good all the time. But let me tell you, you can't put trust in a God that is good and kind of not good or scary over here and whatever. We can't, it's, so you go back to believing. Even though there are moments where you are so attracted to the goodness of God. One of the, I don't know what time it is. You guys okay for a few more minutes? Okay. One of the other questions that I get asked all the time is then, then you don't believe the Bible. Well, I love scripture. Scripture is what we call the Old Testament. The New Testament is, when Jesus ever talks about the scripture or any of the apostles, they're referring to the Hebrew scriptures. And the New Testament, they didn't know, like, oh, look, Holy Bible, we're writing the Holy Bible. You know, they're writing letters to people they love, not realizing that it's going to be put together because it was inspired. So I get asked, so do you believe in the infallible, inerrant word of God? And I say, absolutely. And like Brad Jerzak says, and when he was 18, he grew a beard. Right? The infallibility of Scripture and, and the inerrancy of Scripture was a modern position that a very conservative community of our people inaugurated not that long ago. The scripture in the New Testament never claim inerrancy and infallibility. Never. Inspiration? Absolutely. Actually, inspiration means God breathed. Oh, what does it say? I gave to everyone breath and life and every good thing. Has God breathed into you life? Yes or no? How is your infallibility and inerrancy doing? We have a problem here, yeah? And that's true about especially the Hebrew scriptures. Did you know that the apostles thought that some of the writers of the Hebrew scriptures were wrong about some things? Like Moses was wrong? That's Paul the apostle. That's kind of rough. And, and unless you know the scriptures, you don't realize what Paul is doing. He quotes, 
Now, Paul is no slouch about scriptures, about the Hebrew scriptures. Like, he is, he's taught by Gamaliel. He is one of the top Hebrew scholars in the world. So when he quotes something, and he quote-unquote misquotes something, if you can follow that, he's doing it on purpose. And he takes this one line from Moses. And the line in Moses is, cursed is Cursed by God is every human being who hangs upon a tree. Cursed by God is every human being who hangs upon a tree. Paul quotes that, but he quotes it this way. Cursed is every human being who hangs upon a tree. He takes the by God part off. What's he saying? God doesn't curse anyone who hangs upon a tree. We do. They're hanging upon a tree because we did this. And Isaiah 53 absolutely agrees with Paul. We esteemed him stricken by God. We did that. We put the by God part back on there. But it was we who turned our face away. It's we who spat on him. God doesn't. God is not violent. If you want to see the complete revelation of God, you look to Jesus. I and the Father are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. But what about Revelation? Let's not get into that. But see, my people love Revelation because you have this violent God up till Jesus, and then it's kind of like, okay, let's take a break and do something different. This is like a commercial. And now we're back to the violent God, and it's like, phew. Now we have justification for being violent, and we'll put it under the label justice or something. I don't know about you, but Revelation scared the hell out of me growing up. Plus, we, we used it, I used it, to try to scare my friends into heaven, you know. Completely different subject, which we won't get into. The point I'm trying to make is that Abraham didn't understand the character and nature of God. He had little glimpses. But he ain't there. And, so when, and, and God is slowly beginning to change his mind. But this is the beautiful thing about a God who submits. He submits to bad, bad ideas about his nature. He allows us to say things that are absolutely wrong. One of the, one of the most fundamental wrong things that we created was the sacrificial system. And God climbs into that completely terrible thing and redeems it as it begins to aim toward Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Not really. Okay. You remember um, Abraham and Isaac? The interpretation of that was horrible for me as a missionary kid because it justified my parents laying their children on the altar of missions. That was the passage. And when I was going through the sexual abuse stuff in boarding school and all that, one of the things they said is, you can't tell anybody because it will affect the mission and people will go to hell and their blood will be on your hands. And they justified it with Abraham and Isaac. And my parents justified sending me away to boarding school at six with Abraham and Isaac. And we know from the prophets that God hates sacrifice and there will, be, there will come a lamb one day that will put an end to it. A bloodied lamb. When you look at Abraham's life, he lives in Ur of the Chaldees. Every, every deity on the planet is a bloody deity. They require sacrifice. And the highest form of sacrifice was to take an innocent baby and kill them. Marduk was one of the gods, and they not only killed the baby, they put them into a fire in the valley of Hinnom that becomes the idea of the destruction through fire. And Jeremiah goes to that valley and burns it to the ground. And then it becomes the valley that later becomes Gehenna, that is hell. It is the cleansing through fire. And I, I know in my own heart that that fire that cleanses 
is the love of God, never against me, but is against everything in me that is not of love's kind. Everything in me that doesn't allow me to be fully human and fully alive. And frankly, bring it on. I'm tired of the crap that pushes me to hurt people. Bring it on, and I know it will be painful. Athanasius in about 300 AD, one who crafted the, um, the Nicene Creed, he writes in his, in his book that changed the world, he says, if you trust the goodness of God, you will run to this God with your arms wide open and say, please come and judge me to the core and burn out of me everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive. But the problem is, we have a, a God we can't trust who's not good all the time. And that's one of the areas that God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, Papa, have to begin to dismantle without violating your personal agency. Have you ever prayed, please, God, I'm so bad at making decisions, I'd like you to sort of take over? Right? Please come and make my decisions for you. I mean, for me. Make my decisions and make them right, but you make my decisions. How many times has God said, okay? <laughs> like zero. It's like, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I'm like, well, I got a new plan for you. <laughs> you know, I, I love you and I have a plan for your life. That's it. And God goes like, all right, give it your best shot, but just know I'm not doing anything. And then when it just absolutely falls apart, he still redeems pieces inside of it. And the next day goes, so are we going on our adventure or yours again? Oh, I got a new one. <laughs> Come, follow me. Abraham, when you first meet him as Abram, he lives in Ur of the Chaldees, which is a moon and moon god and goddess worshiping center. Nanu, Nana, and Ningal. Right? And they have child sacrifice. And Abraham's locked into the sacrificial system. And so God wants to start to break this. And so what does God do? Hey, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your child. And Abraham goes, okay, because that's what you do. And his son is so in, indoctrinated into this, he says, okay, and he's not 12 years old. He's like 30 years old. He could take his dad. His dad's not a young pup, right? And we know he's 30 because in the end of this story, in the end of this chapter, it says, oh, when this happened, they heard that their uncle, Abraham's uncle in Padanaram, had a baby girl. What has that got to do with anything? Well, that baby girl turns out to be um, Isaac's wife, and he ends up being 30 years older than she is. But, you know, this is, if you were to put Abraham on a scale of spiritual maturity and insight from A to Z. When he's in Ur of the Chaldees, where do you put him? Oh, he's an A. Right? He doesn't know what's down. You know, he's got a foot in B. I, I will give him that. Because he's in a congregation and he's hearing voices. Right? Nobody else around him is hearing voices. But here's, he's listening to this voice and it says, Abraham, Abram, get out of town. And it's such a powerful nudge in him that he packs up his whole clan and they leave, not knowing where they're going. But so he's got a foot in B. Everybody else is in A. And he, he eventually puts both feet in B. When you get to B, you look at people in A and you go like, idiots. <laughs> they're such idiots. They don't know the truth like we do. We know the truth. They're idiots. But C... Those people are just nuts. To be or not to be, that's it, right? I'm here, those are idiots, those people are nuts, and we're in B, right? Because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Like, we don't know that the Omega exists. We get, we're in B. So God is going like, all right, I, I need you to take a step into C. So here, sacrifice your child. Okay. I mean, if you read the story, he doesn't even, like, blink. And you're going like, this is your son. I mean, if, if, 
if you got a nudge to kill your kids, would you have a problem with that? If you don't, you're mentally ill, right? You're kind of sick. But so he, he takes this up, he goes up to this mountain. As a knife is coming down, God says, stop. Abram, Abraham, I want, I, want you to, I want you to know something new about me. And this was a common thing. But God would say, I have another name that I want you to relate to me. Jehovah Jireh. That's the first time it's used in this story. What's Jehovah Jireh? I am the God who provides. Which, and he's talking about sacrifice. Abram, if you need a sacrifice, I will provide myself. I will provide myself. That's a far cry from, oh, it's such a good thing to sacrifice your children on the altar of ministry or on the altar of missions. No, this is to stop the sacrificial system. And in that story, God says, I know there will be a lamb one day that will take this all away, put an end to sacrifice. But I know you're stuck here, so here's a goat. I'll give you a goat. Right? And then he hears that his bride has been born in Padanaram. That is a beautiful story. That is an invitation. And you have this incremental journey through the lives of these people. And they misunderstand God. They attribute to God all kinds of violence and terrible things. And there is this slow movement. Where is this movement going? To the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. This is the Father. This. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, you have been surrounded by light this whole time and you can't recognize it. Everything is in, through, for, and by Jesus. Did I pick up all my little threads? <sighs> Good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We will have more, please. And so today we pray for the church of Jesus Christ in Missoula. And we ask that you bless the church of Jesus Christ in Missoula. And we ask that you, you lift from our hearts the darkness that would cause us to defend ourselves or to identify ourselves in opposition to the church of Jesus Christ in Missoula. That we would be willing to lay down our selves, our false selves, that we don't have to defend, that we would be able to love one another and those who consider themselves our enemies, that you would cause in us an explosion of your light and your love, that we would begin to find in us greater capacity to love as self-giving, other-centered, sacrificial love, that we would not put our identities in an organization or institution, and we would begin to trust that you in us and in our community of love would begin to help us discern the truth, that in our families, that we, we would break the movement toward violation and separation and violence in every respect that it shows up, and that your love would be expressed in our hearts who is the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that this love would pour out on us and through us and in us. That we wouldn't look to something external to tell us the truth of who we are. But we would ask Jesus, who do you say that I am? And we would allow the burning away of everything that is not of love's kind. That we would rush toward you as the good one the one that we can place our trust, that you never, never act against us, but always for us. And we open our arms wide and say, judge me to the core and burn out of me everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive. And we may we have eyes to see the incremental little ways that you are doing this in us and encourage one another enlarging our hearts 
to celebrate these incremental little steps that we would be open to confessing the truth that is to speak the truth about the wrongs that we have done one to another that we would change our minds that we would love those in front of us one moment at a time and, and we would love our neighbor and the person who who is in front, and that we would not play the game of separation and division at whatever cost to us. May we be alive and may we be burning bushes who by our very nature become attractive. In the name of the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who indwell this habitation, this holy of holies, crafted by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The naos of God, the temple, is in us. The holy of holies. To the praise of your goodness and your kindness and your love. Amen. <laughs>